Good morning. How are you, everybody? <laughs> All right, hi. It's a beautiful morning outside. The sun is still not out. <laughs> but at least, at least we don't have snow on the ground. Yay. Isn't that great? All right, so I think we should probably get started here. So we'll let people come in and uh, so we can leave some time at the end for Q&A. Well, uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning, and uh, thank you for coming to listen to our topic today, which is kind of a hot topic uh, in a sense that almost every day there are five papers get published on that topic. So we're going to talk about the effects of SGL2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists on <coughs> cardiovascular limp events. So that's kind of a little bit be, be the spices in that talk today. And we're going to focus on patients with peripheral arterial disease. Before I get started, I'd like to thank Jensen Pharmaceuticals, as well as United Therapeutics for uh, sponsoring the grand round this morning. All right, so let's take it off. We've got a few disclosures, but nothing, no um, kind of um, financial conflict related to this talk. Uh, all the uh, information is going to be evidence-based. So these are the learning objectives for today. So as you know, peripheral arterial disease is a major um, health problem, underrepresented health problem as always. But it, it does have actually worse outcome than coronary artery disease and cerebrovascular disease. Um, we're going to focus on the uh, effects of SGL2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists in patients with cardiovascular disease. But also, we're going to look into the subgroup of peripheral arterial disease. We're going to also um, summarize the current guidelines and evidence-based recommendations. Uh, we're going to finish with uh, some summary. <clears throat> So globally, there are over than over 236 million people with peripheral arterial disease, and that's up from 200 million in 2010. So you see that it's actually the prevalence of peripheral arterial disease increases year after year. It's the, most, it's, it's the third most common atherosclerotic disease after coronary artery disease and cerebrovascular disease, but it does have more significant cause for morbidity mortality and disability, and we see this in our clinic, clinics and hospital on a daily basis. And then <clears throat> the problem with peripheral arterial disease, not only it's underrepresented, but, optimal, but evidence for optimal CV risk reduction therapy uh, is actually lacking. Most of the data that we have in the literature are focusing on patients with coronary artery disease, but not necessarily peripheral arterial disease. So we know from the REACH registry that MACE actually is worse uh, for patients with peripheral arterial disease than patients with coronary artery disease, like depicted in this diagram here. Um, uh, peripheral arterial disease shown in red and coronary artery disease shown in blue. Uh, one, two, three, four years MACE outcome, and you see actually the uh, patients with peripheral artery disease have actually worse outcome in terms of MACE than patients with coronary artery disease. And from the same um, registry, uh, if you look at MACE and hospitalization at three years, for patients with peripheral arterial disease, coronary artery disease, and cerebrovascular disease. And that's still, you know, you see that significantly more with patients uh, in patients with peripheral arterial disease, as you see from the diagram. And that's despite standard uh, care therapy. Um, and if you look at limp events in patients with peripheral arterial disease at two and four years right here, and you see that about 24 patients, 24% uh, of patients with peripheral arterial disease will have um, a limp event in two to four years, which is horrible. And that's despite uh, appropriate uh, medical therapy in these patients. Let's focus on diabetes and cardiovascular <clears throat> uh, disease, including peripheral arterial disease. As we know that cardiovascular disease continues to be the leading cause for morbidity and mortality in patients with type 2 diabetes. Uh, there are about <clears throat> almost 9 million Americans with peripheral arterial disease, one third of whom have concurrent diabetes mellitus. And, um, and then also patients with diabetes mellitus. It's hard, it's hard sometimes to present with typical symptoms with peripheral arterial disease, so they are actually underestimated due to neuropathy. And as a matter of fact, even patients with, with uh, prediabetes, 20% of patients with uh, prediabetes tend to have abnormal ABI. Um, we also know that diabetes mellitus is a, is a major health problem in patients with peripheral arterial disease because it does increase risk of limp ischemia and amputation, and that's based on increased inflammation, uh, endothelial dysfunction, vasoconstriction, and thrombosis. For years, 
we thought that intensive glucose therapy is better than regular or standard glucose uh, lowering therapy. And that's, <clears throat> there is a trial that initially published in 2009, the VADT study, looking at standard uh, A1C reduction glucose therapy, aiming for A1C up to 8.5 versus intensive um, uh, glucose therapy aiming A1C about seven and looking for outcomes. And actually the follow-up, 15 years follow-up of ADT uh, study was published in New England Journal of Medicine 2019, showing that intensive glucose therapy did not actually show significant benefits in terms of primary outcome, which was composite of MI stroke, uh, worsening CHF amputation, skimming gangrene, or CV death. None of us, uh, uh, primary endpoints actually was significant with intensive glucose therapy. As a matter of fact, from a core trial, um, you know, patients that went in intensive glucose therapy aiming for A1C of six or less actually had worse outcome, had increased mortality in these patients. So um, for the past several years, we had tremendous publications on SGA2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor um, agonists that actually both uh, uh, drug classes showed significant reduction in MACE uh, in patients with type 2 diabetes and uh, uh, with cardiovascular risk. Some of the SGL2 inhibitors actually show substantial reduction in heart hospitalization for heart failure and progression of, coronary, of uh, uh, CKD or chronic kidney disease. As, as always, peripheral arterial disease, patients with peripheral arterial disease were underrepresented in these trials. So we're gonna focus on these trials in terms of cardiovascular risk reduction. And when it, there is data for patients with peripheral arterial disease, we'll present that as we move forward. What is the mechanism of action for SGL2 inhibitors? Um, what, you know, so how do they work? First of all, I have to make it clear, we do not know the exact mechanism behind the benefit, the cardiovascular risk reduction benefit uh, in these patients. But what, you know, what we know about SGL2 um, inhibitors that they block the uh, sodium glucose co-transporter in proximal tubules, leading to glucosuria and natriuria that lowers blood pressure, uh, weights, lipids, uric acid, and that actually improves the uh, arterial stiffness, reduces pre and after load, and that's how probably the benefit for heart failure. But there is a theory about hyperketonemia, so with more ketones, they are better fuel for the heart than uh, glucose. But again, the exact mechanism we don't know as of yet. Um, there are multiple um, agents for SGL2 inhibitors and ADAPA, as you see there, I'm not gonna mention all the names, but we're gonna focus on the ones that are shown in blue today because the other ones are not available in the United States. So this is another schematic view talking about the mechanism of SGL2 or SGLT inhibitors because there is one and two in terms of uh, um, um, uh, receptors. So SGL2 actually is just kind of, as, a, as you see here, there are available in the proximal tubules. They're responsible for more than 90% of the reabsorption of glucose and sodium. There is HGLT1 receptor that's a little bit down the stream that takes over the, around 10% of the reabsorption. Uh, Sotagliflozin, which we'll talk about, actually has the property of uh, inhibiting both 2 and HGL2-1 uh, receptors. With that, what you see is um, increased urinary sodium and glucose excretion, um, and that actually reduces plasma volume. Um, and which actually helps to reduce blood pressure and after load. And with diuresis, you see reduction of uh, ventricular preload, and that helps in uh, ventricular loading uh, conditions. And also, if you look at the uh, pancreas level, there is improved uh, glycemic control, weight loss. And in the kidney level, you see increased erythropoietin production and increase hematocrit. So this is kind of the general uh, mechanism of action for SGL2 or SGLT inhibitors. So now, first, we're going to focus on the reduction on, in, um, in MACE with SGLT, with, with SGLT inhibitors, focusing first on impagliflozin uh, based on the EMPAREG trial that looked at uh, 7,000 patients with type 2 diabetes and established cardiovascular disease. Uh, those patients were randomized to receive either doses of uh, impagliflozin 10 or 25 milligram versus placebo as add-on therapy, uh, looking at outcome of MACE. Uh, there was significant reduction in MACE with EMPA, mainly reduction of cardiovascular uh, death, as you could see here. So this is the primary endpoint was significant. Also, there was significant reduction, as I mentioned, of cardiovascular uh, 
death, uh, death from any cause, and hospitalization for heart failure, even from the empiric trial, that kind of triggers the kind of the question, do these drugs also work uh, for patients with uh, heart failure as well? Just going back here, why do the, all these trials started to happen? As you know, in the mid-2000s, there was an increased risk of cardiovascular mortality in one of the diabetic drugs, Avandia, at that time. So the FDA required that all uh, companies that come up with new anti-diabetic drugs, they have to go into the CVO2 tri C CVOT trials to, in, to prove that they are safe in patients with cardiovascular risk. So, Again, IMPA showed significant reduction of MACE, especially reduction of cardiovascular uh, mortality. Now, looking at MACE in the sub-analysis uh, in patients with peripheral artery disease from the IMPA-REG trial, about 20% of these patients from the IMPA-REG trial had uh, peripheral artery disease at the baseline. And the results were actually consistent for reduction of MACE in patients with PED or without, uh, for reduction of MACE, CV death, heart hospitalization for heart failure, and worsening of nephropathy. And if you look at limp amputation at the bottom, there was no significant difference for limp amputation um, you know, with EMPA versus placebo. And this diagram shows uh, that uh, the outcome for patients with peripheral artery disease versus without were actually consistent for the reduction of MACE, including cardiovascular death. The upper diagram showing cardiovascular death reduction uh, in patients with, and the lower one is uh, patients without peripheral artery disease. The results were consistent. Now, the second trial we're going to talk about with EMPA is heart failure and renal, renal outcome, which is the EMPA-reduced trial, looking at 7,000 patients with heart failure with ejection fraction of 40 or less, so technically half-RAF patients, uh, looking at EMPA versus placebo, and the primary endpoint was CV death and hospitalization for heart failure, and the outcome were actually significantly reduced, in addition to MACE also was significantly reduced. Uh, reduced, as well as renal uh, endpoints were actually significantly reduced, as shown in this diagram uh, right here. So again, the primary endpoint for hospitalization for heart failure, as well as, um, uh, you know, uh, MACE were significantly uh, reduced. And the, the most explanation of uh, outcome was the, uh, based on the reduction of hospitalization for heart uh, failure. Now, the second trial that was published in terms of heart failure patients with EMPA is the emperor preserved looking at patients with half-PAF, um, uh, 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 with half-PAF uh, randomizing to EMPA gliflozin versus placebo as add-on therapy. Um, and the primary endpoint was similar for uh, emperor reduced, which is CV death and hospitalization for heart failure. And the primary endpoint, again, was significant for the reduction of hospitalization for heart failure, as well as cardiovascular death, uh, most likely um, explained or mainly explained by reduction of hospitalization for heart failure. There was no significant reduction of cardiovascular death per se. And then if you look at the um, PED subgroup analysis from the emperor preserved as well as reduced through the poll analysis for both, there were about 8.5% of patients with peripheral arterial disease and patients with peripheral artery disease were more likely to be men, white, and older. And uh, those patients had actually more, well, they were more symptomatic in terms of heart failure presentation, and they had more concurrent uh, comorbidities, as you could see. Not only that, we also saw that patients with peripheral artery disease had elevated risk of, ha uh, of heart failure outcomes including hospitalization for heart failure, death or cause mortality, and composite cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure. So when you have peripheral arterial disease, as we always know, your risk of outcome, cardiovascular outcome, is worse. And we're going to see this as we move on with the slides. And uh, the efficacy of EMPA uh, on cardiorenal outcome was consistent regardless of peripheral arterial disease history. But absolute risk reduction of total heart failure hospitalization was actually higher in patients with peripheral arterial disease. So the absolute risk reduction in patients with peripheral arterial disease was actually higher. So if you have peripheral arterial disease, you have worse outcome, but you might benefit more from the drug. And this is just to show what we just talked about. Uh, the continuous lines are actually, uh, you know, looking at EMPA versus 
uh, uh, placebo in patients with uh, peripheral arterial disease and the dotted lines in patients without. You see that patients with peripheral arterial disease tend to have worse outcome, and, but the reduction of outcome was consistent. As you see on the right side here, the P interaction or interaction p-value was consistent and uh, less, uh, more than 0 0.05. Now, the, th the um, other trial that we're going to uh, uh, actually focus on is the heart failure and real outcome from the IMPA kidney uh, trial, looking at IMPA gliflozin uh, versus placebo in patients with CKD, uh, looking at uh, uh, renal outcome as well as uh, cardiovascular death as a primary composite uh, outcome. And the primary outcome was significantly reduced with IMPA. Uh, versus uh, placebo, as you can see here from, the, uh, from uh, the diagram. So again, renal outcome was improved as well as uh, cardiovascular outcome was improved uh, in the uh, kidney uh, trial. Now, we kind of covered the IMPA, IMPA gliflozin. Let's kind of go back to the reduction of in mace in cana gliflozin or in Vulcana. So the first trial that was published to look at the MACE uh, risk reduction in CANA was the CANVAS and CANVAS renal uh, trial looking at 10,000 patients with type 2 diabetes and high, risk, uh, hard, high cardiovascular risk looking at CANA 300 uh, versus 100 matching placebo and looking at MACE outcome, there was significant reduction in MACE uh, with CANA versus uh, placebo. However, there was no significant reduction in cardiovascular uh, death, as you could see here. So uh, the primary endpoint was significantly uh, reduced, which was MACE in this uh, group of patients. So what happened to the amputation risk with CANA? That made a big noise when the uh, trial was published because there was actually almost double risk, increased risk of amputation with CANA gliflozin uh, based on the CANVAS and CANVAS renal uh, trial, 6.3 versus 3.4. Uh, uh, participants in 1,000 uh, patients. And uh, actually, as a matter of fact, 187 participants had amputation, 290 events, um, 123 single amputation, 71% minor amputation. And the uh, highest uh, absolute risk of amputation happened in patients with history of peripheral arterial disease. So this, again, made a really high noise there. Well, wait a second. So SGL2 inhibitors we should not use in patients with uh, peripheral arterial disease, because remember, we, we talked about peripheral arterial disease as a concurrent comorbidities with diabetes. So this kind of made a, a little uh, noise out there. As a matter of fact, if we look at the sub-analysis of the uh, CANVAS trials, yes, there was, that was confirmed. There was an increased risk of amputation, both major and minor with CANA, and anticipated risk factors for amputation, including prior history of amputation, PED, and neurop neuropathy. So, there are a lot of papers when I looked at this topic that looked at possible underlying mechanism of action. There is nothing confirmed to indicate what was the reason for increased amputation, which we'll cover as we move forward in the slides. And this is just to show that you know both any you know any both you know all am any amputation was increased as well as major, as well as uh, minor amputation uh, risk, as you could see with CANA. Now, the next trial that we're going to talk about with canagliflozin is the renal outcome or credence trial, um, looking at um, 4,000, almost like 4,400 4, patients with type 2 diabetes with albinuric uh, coron uh, uh, CKD, uh, looking at canagliflozin uh, versus placebo as add on therapy to ACE inhibitor as well. And looking at the uh, you know, uh, composite endpoint of uh, renal outcome as well as uh, death from renal and cardiovascular causes, uh, the primary endpoint was significantly reduced, as well as MACE hospitalization for heart failure. Interestingly, the amputation rate was not different in the Credence trial. So that's kind of a little bit different from the initial trials that we talked about um, uh, earlier. So um, again, you know, there was significant uh, reduction in the primary endpoint, um, as well as you know, renal endpoint, as well as cardiovascular uh, endpoints, including hospitalization for heart failure and cardiovascular death, as you can see from the trial. So now looking at the pool analysis of both CANVAS and Credence, focusing on the PED outcome, so there were about 21% of these patients had peripheral arterial disease at baseline. The results were actually consistent uh, for the cardiovascular and renal benefits in patients with or without peripheral arterial disease. Uh, 
But again, the absolute benefit of canagliflozin was greater in patients with peripheral arterial disease. Uh, interestingly, major uh, adverse limb events were not increased with cana versus um, uh, placebo in patients with or without peripheral arterial disease. And then so that's why FTE re decided to remove the black box warning of lower limb amputation with canagliflozin. Initially, when we saw from Canvas that there was increased risk of amputation, FTE decided to place a black, black box warning, but when Credence was published and the pool analysis wa was published, that block, black box warning was removed. And this is just to show that uh, patients with peripheral arterial disease right here, they had actually worse outcome than patients without peripheral arterial disease, but risk reduction of the primary endpoint was consistent uh, in patients with or without, and this is for MACE, and this is for cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure. Now, we finished talking about canagliflozin. Now, let's shift to the third uh, SGL2 inhibitor, which is dabagliflozin, looking at re risk reduction of MACE based on the declared TIMI 58 trial, looking at about 17,000 patients with type 2 diabetes, um, including 10,000 patients with without, actually, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, looking at DAPA versus placebo, and the dosage that was studied is 10 milligram, and looking at MACE as a primary endpoint. Although there was no significant reduction in the primary endpoint, which was MACE, just to have to emphasize that with DAPA, there was significant reduction of cardiovascular uh, death or hospitalization for heart failure, mostly driven by the reduction of hospitalization for heart failure. If you look at amputation risk, there was no evidence uh, that there was increased risk of, of, of amputation. So there was no significant uh, increased risk of amputation with DAPA versus uh, placebo. This is just to show you that there was a significant reduction in the cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure, but MACE outcome did not ma uh, make it for uh, superiority based on the declared to me uh, heart failure trial. And now looking at the PED outcome uh, based on a sub-analysis of the declared TIMI 58 with DAPA, there were about 6% of patients from the original trial had history of peripheral arterial disease. And again, consistently, when you have a history of peripheral arterial disease, you tend to have more risk for mass cardiovascular death, hospitalization for heart failure, as you could see in this uh, slide here. But the relative risk reduction uh, with DAPA in patients with peripheral arterial disease versus without was consistent. You still see a reduction of, of outcome, including CV death and hospitalization or heart failure uh, with PED versus without. As a matter of fact, you know, absolute risk reduction was greater in patients with peripheral arterial disease than without. And we saw also the limp event, there was no significant difference between DAPA and placebo. This is just to show that here for MACE, you know, patients with peripheral arterial disease uh, depicted in uh, brown uh, color here is kind of more than patients with that, and so was the cardiovascular death with hospitalization for heart failure and renal primary endpoint. But if you have polyvascular disease depicted here in red, actually had worse MACE, cardiovascular death, hospitalization for heart failure, renal primary endpoint, and amputation, in general, uh, with patients, you know, poly polyvascular disease had worse outcome than um, patients with peripheral arterial disease than patients without peripheral arterial disease. So again, uh, we tend to kind of forget about patients with peripheral arterial disease. Consistently, these patients have worse outcome, but they tend actually to benefit from the drug um, uh, than uh, placebo, as you see from the slide. Now, the second trial with DAPA that we're going to focus on is DAPA heart failure uh, trial looking at uh, DAPA in patients with uh, half RAF or ejection fraction of less than 40, um, DAPA versus placebo, and the composite endpoint was hospitalization for heart failure or cardiovascular death that was significantly reduced with DAPA. Not only that, if you look at the subcomponents of the primary endpoint, including hospitalization for heart failure, cardiovascular death, or even death from any cause, all of which were really significantly reduced with DAPA uh, versus placebo. There was no significant difference in terms of amputation risk. So we kept looking into amputation risk because there was a signal of increased amputation with CANA. We just wanted to make sure that there was no risk of amputation with the other SGLT1 inhibitors. 
So this is just to show uh, that you know the primary endpoint was was actually reduced, which was hospitalization for heart failure, cardiovascular death. So was the uh, subcomponents, including hospitalization for heart failure, death from cardiovascular cause or all cause mortality, all of which were significantly uh, reduced, as you could see. And now looking at renal outcome with dapagliflozin or dapa CKD trial, looking at 4,000 patients with uh, history of CKD with albuminuria, looking at DAPA versus placebo as add-on therapy. And the primary endpoint was composite of sustained decline of EGFR and death or in-stage renal disease or death from renal or cardiovascular causes. Um, that was significantly reduced, again, with DAPA um, uh, versus placebo. Uh, so was also the subcomponent of death from renal causes also was significantly reduced. And amputation risk, again, was not increased, which was kind of reassuring. Um, this is just to show that, again, the primary endpoint was reduced. So was the uh, renal-specific component was significantly reduced. The, compo uh, the composite of death from cardiovascular causes and hospitalization for heart failure was significantly reduced, so um, uh, any cause uh, of death was also significantly reduced, which is really all these subcomponents were significantly reduced with TAP, DAPA um, uh, versus uh, placebo. So if you look at the pool analysis from all the 2B3A trials with, with DAPA, looking at patients with uh, peripheral arterial disease, uh, there was no significant difference in terms of amputation again, but the risk of amputation that we found from that uh, uh, pool analysis was history of neuropathy, uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, or dyslipidemia. Now, we're going to shift gear and talk about sotagliflozin, which was the, mo the most recent one to be approved for the treatment of heart failure. What's something interesting about sotagliflozin or MPEFA in PEFA that actually not only it blocks the HDL2 receptor, but it also blocks the HDL2-1 receptor. Remember, there was two and one. So SOTA actually blocks both. And then first trial that we're going to talk about is the SCORE trial, looking at cardiovascular um, outcome in 10,000 patients with type 2 diabetes, uh, CKD, and risk of cardiovascular disease were randomized to receive SOTA, gliflozin versus placebo. And the primary endpoint was cardiovascular death, hospitalization for heart failure, or urgent vis visits for heart failure. And the study was actually early ended because of loss of fund, but, but um, results were actually uh, were significant uh, for reduction of primary endpoint with SOTA versus uh, placebo. Uh, MAIS endpoint was actually also reduced with SOTA versus uh, placebo. And this is just to show that you know, cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure was significantly reduced, so did uh, the MACE outcome. However, there was no significant reduction. If you look at the uh, cardiovascular death uh, subgroup, there was no significant uh, reduction in that subcomponent. Uh, uh, so then the uh, heart failure outcome with SOTA was actually studied in the Soloist heart failure trial, looking at 1,200 patients with type 2 diabetes and recent hospitalization for acute decompensated heart failure, either reduced or preserved. I have to focus and tell you that those patients had decompensated heart failure. They just hospitalized in the hospital. That's what makes SOTA gliflozin a little bit different than the other HG2 inhibitors. And those patients either had um, reduced or preserved rejection fraction, uh, patient randomized to SOTA versus placebo, and the primary endpoint, again, was cardiovascular death or hospitalization uh, for heart failure. Again, the trial was ended uh, earlier due to loss of fund, but primary endpoint was significantly uh, reduced, but the cardiovascular death was not significantly reduced. Uh, this is just to show that the primary endpoint uh, with cardiovascular death and heart hospitalization for heart failure was significantly reduced with SOTA versus uh, placebo, mostly explained by the reduction of hospitalization for heart failure, not necessarily by the reduction of cardiovascular death, as you can see from the table. So uh, the last one of the SGL2 inhibitors we're going to focus on is ertogliflozin from the Virtus trial. Uh, looking at CV outcome, you know, about 8,000 patients with type 2 diabetes with a third cardiovascular risk, randomized to ertogliflozin versus placebo. I have to, you know, go fast on this because there was no significant reduction in MACE um, but, uh, or cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure. So the trial, although it met non-inferiority, it did not meet superiority. Uh, they were numerically higher amputation, but that was not significant. So I'm just going to pass there. So this is actually 
the summary of uh, dosing and indication for all SGL2 or SGLT inhibitor drugs, uh, including EMPA, which is marketed as Jardian, Scana, or in, in, in Vocana, Dabagliflozin, Farsiga, and Sodagliflozin, and PEFA. Um, so these are the dosages that are available. I have to say that uh, although EMPA, CANA, DAPA, they are all indicated to improve glycemic control, SOTA is not because the focus of that drug to start from the start go is looking at heart hospitalization for heart failure and cardiovascular uh, mortality. Um, all the drugs have data for hospitalization for heart failure and cardiovascular uh, risk, although CANA um, actually is not indicated just for heart failure by itself. It has, you have to have type 2 diabetes and increased risk of, uh, of cardiovascular risk to be indicated for that indication. But definitely EMPA, DAPA, SOTA, they have the indication of uh, reduction of hospitalization for heart failure and cardiovascular death in patients with heart failure, period. It doesn't have to be reduced half ref or half pef for ejection for any ejection uh, fraction. So these are the indications. Uh, and the doses that are available. Just to summarize the SGL2 inhi uh, SGLT inhibitor, uh, empagliflozin was uh, shown to reduce MACE based on the EMPARIC trial, and also reduction of hospitalization for heart failure and cardiovascular death based on the emperors, so like emperor reduced and preserved, and also showed significant reduction of renal cardiovascular uh, endpoint based on the EMPA kidney. There was no significant difference in amputation based on the EMPARIC uh, sub-analysis. Whereas if we summarize the data for, for canagliflozin, there was significant reduction of MACE based on the CANVAS trial, but remember, there was increased risk of amputation. Um, also, there we saw a reduction of cardiovascular and renal outcome with credence. Um, however, there was no difference in amputation risk. Uh, for DAPA, you know, we saw significant reduction of hospitalization for heart failure, cardiovascular death from DAPA, heart failure, and also reduction of renal and cardiovascular outcome from DAPA kidney or DAPA CKD, there was no difference in terms of MACE based on de declared TIMI uh, 58, no difference in amputation risk uh, for sodagliflozin reduction, significant reduction of hospitalization for heart failure, cardiovascular death, and MACE based on the score soloist um, heart failure trials. Ertagliflozin, we didn't see significant uh, really uh, superiority for uh, cardiovascular endpoint. There was no significant difference in terms of amputation risk. There is no really data on the subgroup of patients with peripheral arterial disease in the sotagliflozin trials. There were about 21% of patients from the initial trial scored in Solois that had a history of peripheral arterial disease. We don't have data for the outcome for these patients as of yet. Now we're gonna shift gears and start talking about the GLP-1 receptor agonist. So how do these guys work? Uh, so as you know, the GLP-1 actually gets secreted from the L cells as, as a response uh, to food, and that actually gets actually inhibited or, um, uh, yes, inhibited by DPP-4 after a few minutes, and that GLP-1 is reduced in patients with type 2 diabetes. With GLP-1 receptor agonist, it actually increases levels of GLP-1, which actually increases the secretion of insulin, reduces secretion of glucagon, it delays the gastric emptying, reducing glucose, and that also reduce weight, blood pressure, triglyceride. Um, it actually potentiates natriuresis, which helps in anti-atherosclerotic and thrombotic uh, endpoints. We're going to talk more about the mechanism of action in the coming slide, but these are the dr drugs that we're going to focus on uh, today right here. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about uh, GIP and GLP-1 receptor agonist terazipatide, which made a big noise recently for the significance of weight reduction, up to 25% of weight reduction in these patients. Why I'm not going to focus on it? Because there is no yet trials to look, uh, trial results to uh, focus on cardiovascular out outcome as of yet. This is just to summarize the uh, uh, mechanism of action, but again, I have to emphasize, we don't know the exact mechanism of action based, based on which GLP-1 receptor agonists reduce cardiovascular risk. Um, with GLP-1 receptor agonists, you, you have increased risk of GLP-1, which is available in most of the organs. So there is a lot of research ongoing right now to find out what is the, what is the uh, effects of increased GLP-1 levels in the brain, stomach, heart, and so forth. If you look at the pancreas with increase of insulin secretion, um, reduction of glucagon, you get really improved glycemic control. 
Uh, in the stomach, gastric amputation gets slower, so you lose weight with that. Uh, in the brain, you know, it actually, uh, you know, potentiates food. Uh, it reduces food intake um, and water intake, and that has actually impact on weight reduction. For the heart, it actually improves glucose utilization, uh, cardio protection, and so forth. There are a lot of research going on in that GLP-1 receptors that are available everywhere, almost in the, uh, in the body. So now we're going to look at the MACE risk reduction with GLP-1 receptor agonists. First, looking at dolaglotide uh, from the Rewind trial, looking at 9,000 or almost 10,000 patients with type 2 diabetes and previous cardiovascular event to risk, looking at weekly dolaglotide versus placebo, looking at primary endpoint of MACE. There was significant reduction in MACE with dolaglotide, mostly driven, driven by the reduction of stroke, which is amazing. These drugs started to show not only MACE risk reduction, but some of which, including dolaglutide, showed reduction of stroke. Because for a while, we didn't have really good uh, uh, you know, uh, drugs to reduce risk of stroke in these patients. And then this is just to show you, um, you know, um, the primary endpoint, which was composite of, of cardiovascular uh, risk, and, you know, including cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, mostly driven by the reduction of non-fatal stroke, as you see. Now, there was a PED outcome trial looking at dolaglotide in patients with uh, peripheral arterial disease, looking at 60 patients with type 2 diabetes, uh, metformin monotherapy versus metformin combined with dolaglotide, looking at endothelial progenitor cells, as well as brachial ankle pulse wave velocity, which actually um, is a surrogate for um, you know, um, um, endothelial function or resistance. And then, so the results actually showed significant increased risk of nitric oxide and also endothelial progenitor cells with dolaglutide uh, versus placebo as add-on to metformin. And this is just to show, um, this is the outcome for the progenitor cells uh, with metformin uh, versus metformin with dolaglutide at baseline versus after 12 weeks, you see that significant increase in the endothelial uh, production and also reduced in the resistance of arterial resistance at 12 weeks with the com combination therapy versus metformin. So this is actually a signal that these drugs, GLP-1 receptor, might have a future in patients with peripheral arterial disease. Now, looking at MACE risk reduction with liraglutide, the LEADER trial, looking at around uh, 9,300 patients with type 2 diabetes and higher cardiovascular risk, 81% had established cardiovascular disease, looking at liraclotide versus placebo. And again, the primary endpoint was MACE, was significantly reduced. And that actually now is driven by the reduction of cardiovascular death. Um, if you look at the post hoc analysis uh, from the LEADER trial, actually patients with per, the uh, diabetic foot ulcer had significant reduction of amputation. So again, the signal is getting stronger now. Oh, wait a second. So maybe a GLP-1 receptor agonist might be the right drugs uh, for patients with type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular risk to reduce MACE rather than SGL2 inhibitors. So again, liraglutide shows significant reduction in amputation in patients with uh, DFU as you see. So again, you know, the primary endpoint of MACE was significantly reduced uh, with liraglutide, mostly explained by the reduction of cardiovascular death. So now shifting gears to semaglutide, um, looking at reduction in MACE based on the SUSTAIN-6 or Pioneer-6 trial. SUSTAIN-6 looked at the sub-Q uh, sub dosage and Pioneer oral. By the way, semaglutide is the only GLP-1 receptor that comes in oral uh, 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 dosing. But uh, although the SUSTAIN-6 trial showed positive uh, risk reduction of MACE, the Pioneer-6 trial did not show really positive results for MACE reduction. So now for that indication, just the sub-Q semaglutide uh, should be considered. And the results of MACE, as I said, significantly reduced from the SUSTAIN-6 trial, mostly driven by the reduction again in non fatal stroke, as you could see from the diagram here. So again, may significantly reduce, mostly explained by the reduction of non-fatal stroke. Now, if you look at the PD outcome from a, a post hoc analysis from LEADER with liraglutide and uh, SUSTAIN-6 for semaglutide, uh, there were about 12.7% of LEADER uh, patients had peripheral arterial disease 14% in patients with, in, in the trial of sustained 6 
Um, again, patients with peripheral arterial disease had significantly increased risk of MACE compared to patients without. And the benefits for MACE reduction was consistent, but the absolute risk reduction was greater in patients with peripheral arterial disease. Again, the same message that I want to tell you, that patients with peripheral arterial disease had worse outcome, but they still benefited from, um, uh, from the drug. And this is just to, sh just to show that MACE uh, for leader and sustain uh, patients with peripheral arterial disease had worse outcome depicted in blue. And there is a risk reduction with the studied drug versus placebo was consistent. Uh, that's what the uh, slide here is showing. Now, shifting gears with, uh, to talk about albiglutide from the Harmony trial, looking at 9,400 9, patients with type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular death. Uh, looking at weekly sima, uh, albiglutide versus placebo, looking at MACE endpoint at 1.5 years, significant reduction in MACE, mostly driven by the reduction of MI this time. The drug was actually withdrawn from the market due to economic reasons, so we don't have the drug available at this point, but know that there was so significant reduction uh, in MACE uh, with uh, albiglutide versus uh, placebo, mostly driven by the reduction of MI. Now, uh, the next drug we're going to talk about is exenatide from the Excel trial looking at MACE endpoint, um, and that also showed significant reduction of, uh, actually showed non-inferior uh, risk reduction of MACE. There was no superiority. The superiority margin was not met here with p-value of 0 0.06, um, as you could see from the trial. However, there was significant reduction of all-cause mortality with exenatide. Uh, versus placebo, but again, the primary endpoint MACE uh, was not uh, significant. So if we look at the PD outcome from the Excel trial with, with exenatide, again, uh, patients with peripheral arterial disease, which comprised 19% of the study group, had higher MACE, all-cause mortality, more frequent lower extremity amputation, as you could see from the slide, but the results were consistent for the endpoint of MACE and amputation with exenatide versus placebo in patients with or without uh, peripheral arterial disease, all-cause mortality, again, lower with exenatide uh, in patients with or without uh, PED. So the results were uh, consistent. So again, you know, for MACE and male, the results were consistent. Now, the last drug we're going to talk about from GLP-1 uh, receptor agonist is lexicinatide. Um, and again, looking at patients with type 2 diabetes, this time history of acute coronary syndrome, looking at lexicinatide versus placebo, four-point MACE, Unfortunately, the, the, uh, the, the, the trial didn't show really superiority for this drug versus uh, placebo, so I'm going to pass quick here. What is the current and future research? Um, there is actually a, a, a couple of trials. There are a couple of trials that we are looking at. Stardust with liraglutide. Look, it's an open-label randomized control trial to evaluate uh, liraglutide on peripheral perfusion as compared to aggressive treatment for cardiometabolic risk factor in patients with type 2 and peripheral arterial disease, the results are pending. Um, I was the primary investigator for the STRIDE trial that closed recently, looking at patients with uh, peripheral arterial disease, uh, you know, researching or studying semaglutide versus placebo on the walking ability in patients with type 2 and peripheral arterial disease, and it's closed recently, pending results. So we'll see if really GLP-1 receptor agonist uh, might change the, um, the game for uh, patients with peripheral arterial disease. So this is just to summarize the uh, uh, GLP-1 receptor um, uh, uh, drug dosing and indication. All of these drugs have indication to improve glycemic control, reduction of MACE, but also liraglutide and semaglutide, they have indication for weight reduction, and that's actually marketed under Saxenda and Vigovi or Vigovi for semaglutide for uh, weight uh, reduction, okay? So these are kind of the indications that uh, we have for GLP-1 uh, receptor agonists. And again, all, you know, dolaglutide, liraglutide, albiglutide showed significant reduction in MACE. As you can see, dolaglutide mostly driven by the reduction of stroke, liraglutide reduction of cardiovascular death, and albiglutide reduction in MI. Uh, in terms of the exenatide, lexenatide, there was non-inferior, but there was no su superiority. Remember that liraglutide, you know, based on the post hoc post analysis, there was significant reduction in amputation risk with liraglutide versus a placebo in patients with peripheral arterial disease.
Now, in the, past, in the last couple of minutes, we're going to focus on the risk of amputation. What happened in these patients with a SHIELD-2 inhibitor? Uh, why there was a signal for increased amputation in the CANVAS trial? As I said, you know, it was interesting to see increased risk of amputation with CANVAS, but not necessarily in the CREDENCE trial with, uh, uh, you know, so that the question is what happened. The problem that we, you know, based on the current research, we don't know the exact mechanism why CANA and the first initial trial with, with, with Canvas and Canvas showed significant increased risk of amputation with Credence, it didn't. And also, the other SGL2 inhibitors, we didn't see that signal of increased amputation. There are proposed mechanisms uh, that, you know, with glucosuria, you know, you get hypoperfusion, and that might increase risk of, of amputation. And that's showed in the Sardia uh, gene trial, looking at increased risk of amputation with diuresis. That was actually, uh, you know, um, consistent uh, with the result that uh, meta-analysis that looking at uh, control randomized trial with all HDL2 inhibitors in patients with type 2 diabetes, that, you know, there was a positive association between HDL2 inhibitor and reduction of blood pressure and increased risk of, of amputation. Uh, based on another cohort, that association was not really proven. So we don't yet know what is the mechanism behind the possibility of increased risk of amputation that was seen in, uh, with CANA in the initial trial. The, um, so this slide showing that there are multiple observational studies looking at risk of amputation, uh, like one of these uh, you know, observational studies, like three of them, showed no difference in amputation with even CANA glyphosate compared to non sgl 2 inhibitors. Uh, there was one actually showing lower amputation risk with GL2 inhibitors, even including canagliflozin, compared to sulfonuria. One study showed higher amputation with GL2 inhibitor compared to DPP4. So again, the results are really kind of heterogeneous. Um, also, another observational study showed uh, twofold increased risk of, HGL, of amputation with GL2 inhibitors. Another observational study from a Swedish uh, database showed also increased risk of amputation. Um, and then the data continues. You know, these kind of few observational studies showed no difference of amputation. So the, the message here, there is a heterogeneity in terms of results for amputation risk with the HGL2 inhibitor. Maybe because of the population, studies were different, different methods, uh, dif different drugs studied. So, um, until more research is available, I think we should uh, or we may need to avoid using SGL2 inhibitors, especially canagliflozin, in patients with history of peripheral disease with increased risk of amputation. Maybe we should think about using GLP-1 receptor agonists. So now focusing on risk of amputation with GLP-1 receptor agonists, there's really no strong data in general, but as I mentioned from the LEADER trial with liraglutide, there was a, a signal of a reduced risk of amputation. Um, there was a real-world study uh, with about, in about uh, 10,000 patients with, uh, you know, that used GLP-1 receptor agonists, showed lower rates of death, cardiovascular disease, ischemic stroke, peripheral vascular disease, and lower limb complications with GLP-1 receptor. And that's also seen in the Scandinavian population-based study, lower risk of limp event with GLP-1, uh, especially liraglutide versus DTP-4. Um, a retrospective analysis from Taiwanese trial also showed risk reduction of male with GLP-1 receptor agonist versus DTP-4. Um, this was mainly reduced by risk of amputation in mace. So this is just the last slide, a couple of slides, kind of summarizing what we talked about today. Um, if you look at uh, impagliflozin uh, from the Empereg, significant reduction in MIS uh, right here, especially reduction of cardiovascular uh, death. The Emperor reduced and Emperor preserved for significant reduction of cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure, uh, mostly driven by the reduction of hospitalization for heart failure, but not necessarily cardiovascular death. With canagliflozin, the CANVAS trial showed significant reduction in MIS. Credence, significant reduction in renal outcome and cardiovascular outcome, including cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure. And then for the declare for dabagliflozin, significant um, uh, reduction of cardiovascular death and hospitalization for um, heart failure, but not necessarily MACE outcome. Uh, based on DAPA heart failure, a significant reduction of cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure in patients with um, half-RAF. Uh, 
DAPA CKD, significant reduction of, of renal outcome and cardiovascular outcome. Sotagliflozin, based on the score, significant reduction in cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure, as well as MACE with sotagliflozin. With soloist trial, significant reduction of cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure with soda versus placebo. Uh, we didn't see that superiority with ertigliflozin. And then the summary for GLP-1 receptor agonists based on these trials, uh, dolaglutide uh, showed significant reduction um, in MACE. Uh, so did liraglutide, so did semaglutide uh, based on the sustained. But remember, the oral form of uh, semaglutide in the Pioneer trial did not show significant reduction in MACE. Um, albiglutide, the Harmony trial, significant reduction in MACE. Uh, there was no significant reduction in MACE with exenatide or lexisenatide here. <coughs> And then the last one here is just showing the um, PD outcome from this trial. The MPREG, if you look at the PD subgroup, the results were consistent for the reduction of MACE with MPA versus placebo in patients with or without PD, with P interaction is more than 0, 0 0.5. That also was seen in Canvas, uh, uh, you know, significant reduction in MACE in even patients with peripheral artery disease. But remember, the initial Canvas trial showed increased risk of of amputation, but at the subgroup analysis, um, looking at history of, of PED, uh, the results were consistent for the MACE reduction. And also the results were consistent uh, for the um, cardiovascular death and hospitalization and MACE outcome uh, in based on the dabagliflozin from the declared timid trial based if you have PED or you don't have PED, the results were consistent. Remember with liraglutide, we saw significant reduction in amputation with liraglutide versus placebo. We didn't see really uh, uh, significant reduction outcome with Excel, but the results were consistent. Now, this is kind of a summary of the societal guidelines now. So the summary of this, I'm not gonna go over all of these, but they are consistent in terms of their recommendations. Uh, so if you have type two diabetes, a high risk for established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, the, uh, diabetic kidney disease of heart failure, they do recommend SGL2 inhibitor, GLP-1 receptor agonist that demonstrated cardiovascular benefit. But if you have uh, diabetic kidney disease, they do recommend SGL2 inhibitor based on the data that we uh, went over. If you have type 2 diabetes and, uh, and established cardiovascular uh, disease, there is actually more now recommendation to consider combination of GLP-1 receptor agonist and HDL2 inhibitor, especially in patients with uh, chronic kidney disease. But if you have half RAF of half PAF, of course, the winner is HDL2 inhibitor, um, and especially if you have an EGFR of more than 20. Um, and if you have kidney disease with albuminuria, again, HDL2 inhibitor, um, you should be considering. And again, all these guidelines are kind of consistent, including the um, you know 2022 American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, and Heart Failure uh, Association uh, guidelines, they do recommend actually SG2 inhibitor regardless of type 2 diabetes. And now you're actually, regardless of what kind of heart failure you have, half PEF or half RAF or mild reduced ejection refraction, you really need to consider HDL2 inhibitor because it's the first class recommendation before anything else, especially for half uh, PEF. So this is what kind of a summary algorithm that I created with my colleagues here. Um, in terms of focusing on the peripheral artery disease piece. If you have adult with type 2 diabetes with established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, of course, you know, you have to consider uh, or we recommend both either, you know, or um, is GL2 inhibitor or GLP-1 receptor agonist. For patients with diabetic kidney disease and EGFR of more than 20 or more, Consider SGL2 inhibitors to reduce risk of, you know, DKD and heart failure endpoints, and including these three drugs right here. But if you have peripheral artery disease or EGFR of less than 20, so I added peripheral artery disease here, consider GLP-1 receptor agonist, and maybe liraglutide might be the winner because of the current um, evidence. But again, this is not a controller mice trial. More data is available to point to strongly recommend lira versus other uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist. Of course, you have to discuss that risk and benefits with your patients. Uh, look at the coverage as well, too. In summary, what we learned today, um, peripheral artery disease and type 2 diabetes are prevalent and often concurrent major health problems with increased morbidity 
and mortality is GL2 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptors showed significant reduction in MACE in patients with type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Some, while some SGLT inhibitors have shown a significant reduction in cardiovascular mortality, heart failure, hospitalization, and renal outcome, few GLP-1 GLP receptor drugs have uh, showed significant reduction in weight and stroke risk. Um, we also saw that patients with uh, peripheral arterial disease consistently had worse um, you know, cardiovascular endpoint. So I want you really to think when you have a patient with peripheral arterial disease, it's a very red big alarm there for you. We also saw that risk re relative risk reduction of cardiovascular outcome was generally consistent. Actually, absolute risk reduction of these risks were actually better in patients with or more with, in patients with peripheral arterial disease. So please make sure you remember to treat these patients and not kind of to forget about them. Amputation risk, there was kind of inconsistent data that possible increased risk, or there was some signal of increased risk, uh, you know, with amputation, especially with canagliflozin. Uh, there was signal of reduced uh, male outcome or major limb event in, patient, uh, in patients that uh, use GLP-1 receptor agonist missed mainly with uh, liraglutide. I know the data is, 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 is tremendous. I tried to uh, summarize it, and I think we finished on time. Uh, this is uh, just a picture of the sunset in Gaza, and uh, we pray for peace for Gaza Strip at this point. Thank you, and have a great morning. See if you have questions. A lot of data. <laughs> Dr. Stephenson. Uh, thanks for the great talk, Mia. Um, yeah. Quick uh, question, I guess, for you is, uh, for our child disease is, I think, somewhat difficult to define, and I'm sure across all these uh, trials, they probably use different definitions. What was sort of this, is there a kind of mostly a standard or? Yeah, so peripheral arterial disease is usually defined with an ABI of less than 0 0.9, which also go different from what the guidelines tell us now, yeah. which is 1 to 1 1.3 is the ABI uh, kind of cut point. But most of the trials use 0 0.90 for the ABI cutoff and lower, or patients that had a revascularization or patients that had uh, more than 50% stenosis based on the peak systolic velocities on the ultrasound, or patients that also had revascularization for carotid or more than 50% uh, stenosis of the carotid arteries. That's kind of the most consistent um, kind of definition sure. of peripheral arterial disease in most of these trials. Did they screen all these patients for peripheral vascular disease, or where did are you yes. see some subgroup of basic yes. med patients? So, so most of the MACE uh, studies that are looking at MACE, uh, most of these, tri these trials consider patients with peripheral arterial disease as patient as a risk, major risk factor for MACE because most of these trials that we looked at MACE outcome with GLP-1 receptor agonists or SGL2 inhibitors um, looking at MACE outcome, peripheral arterial disease was one of the major cardiovascular risk categories that were actually there to include the patient in the trial. So yes, they were looking at, and some, we have these exact percentages as I showed you in the slides there with each trial, how many, what percentage of these patients had peripheral disease in the trial. So that ranges from 6% all the way up to 25 to 29%. Uh, you know, fantastic talk, and you know it's a great talk when it just raises so many questions in your mind. Yeah. And it, it is a lot of data to try and keep track of, so I'll just yes. ask you one to remind me. If you look at the SGLT2 inhibitors, um, it didn't seem like in your data there were any examples that they reduced cardiovascular mortality by themselves. It was always a combined endpoint, and that combined endpoint, the benefit was always on the heart failure side. Correct. So, okay. I just wanted to make sure I understood that from your so, summary slides. So, it actually, it's, it varies um, from MPEG, the reduction of MACE is mostly explained by the reduction of cardiovascular mortality, uh, if you look at the MACE out outcome. From the uh, DAPA heart failure, actually, the reduction of hospitalization for heart failure as well as the cardiovascular uh, death also, the primary endpoints, the subgroup of primary endpoints, including cardiovascular death, was also reduced with DAPA uh, versus placebo. So it varies from one drug to another, you know, based on the outcome, MACE versus heart failure. Uh, 
So some of these drugs show, of course, the general mass risk reduction, mostly explained by either reduction of cardiovascular death or just the general mass reduction. So Amperic, again, showed significant reduction of cardiovascular death as a subcomponent of the primary endpoint from the Amperic uh, versus uh, placebo. In the, um, and actually, if you look at the um, um, DAPA heart failure, again, with DAPA gliflozin, not just the uh, primary endpoint for heart failure hospitalization, cardiovascular death as a composite was reduced, but also cardiovascular death was reduced, which we did not see in the heart failure study with empagliflozin. It varies, but again, the primary endpoint, the cardiovascular death by itself, it was not a solely as a primary endpoint, was a secondary endpoint, so it was not powered necessarily to look at cardiovascular death. But the results would it actually vary between the you know between the drugs based on the primary endpoint. Some of them really showed cardiovascular risk, uh, cardiovascular death reduction uh, based on whatever trial that they were you know they were looking at. Yeah. I got to that, Nate, uh, yeah. Was there in your presentation? I may may have missed it. Was there any uh, dis discrimination in in peripheral artery disease in those with and without diabetes and the effects of these drugs in those two situations? So uh, most of most of the trials, you know, especially for MACE that were done in patients with uh, type 2 diabetes, but definitely, um, you know, for the heart failure uh, subgroups, because some of these trials did not require to have diabetes to be enrolled in the heart failure trials. Um, in general, uh, there were actually patients with type 2 diabetes tend to have worse outcome, as you know, with peripheral artery disease. But that was not necessarily looked at in these kind of sub-analysis with peripheral artery disease. Most of the sub-analysis that I presented looking at uh, patients with peripheral artery disease versus without. So we did not go further next step to look at patients within those patients, whether they have diabetes or not, and whether that affected the outcome. But definitely, in general, we know that diabetes, actually, as you know, very well know that um, it actually affects the uh, outcome, causing worse outcome. Yes, Sarah? Where do you see this going in far, as far as, you know, prescribing specialty? I mean, I think here we have your expertise. We have, you know, a lot of cardiovascular specialties. But, you know, say for us fellows going out and maybe more of a community practice, where do you see this going in patients that... I mean, I was That's absolutely unaware question. about the cardiovascular. You know, this is a very good question, very powerful one. Thank you for asking this, because when these, when all of this data is coming out now for such a diabetic drug, started as a diabetic drug, now it's a cardiology, cardiovascular drugs, actually, this SGA2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists. For, for a while, the cardiologists and vascular specialists stay shy a little bit away from, oh, well, I'm not going to deal with diabetic drugs, right? Because, well, hell no, I'm not going to worry about <laughs> A1C, A1C reduction. I'm not going to check glucose. Who cares, I mean? You know, but now we really know for sure that these drugs are, are cardiovascular drugs, not necessarily diabetic drugs. For the fact that, you know, um, you know, these drugs now indicated even in patients without diabetes because the results were consistent for superiority in patients with or without uh, diabetes. So definitely now there is a huge shift, paradigm shift in prescriptions uh, for these drugs for the cardiology community. And I know my, my colleagues here in the cardi cardiovascular department, they have the cardiometabolic metabolic and prevention uh, clinic that they prescribe this on a daily basis. I do do that with my patients with peripheral artery disease. Um, and now I think, you know, we really need to take a, um, a partnership with endocrinologists to kind of also focus on cardiovascular uh, risk reduction, because these indications are cardiovascular indications, they're not diabetic. So don't wait for the endocrinologist to kind of the primary care physicians to go after the mass risk reduction of male or that risk. It's, it's our job to do this. And that's why you see a lot of newer publications from American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, focusing on these drugs. Say, listen, cardiologists, this is our role. This is really, we have to, to do this. Now you're going to see more of prescriptions written by cardiovascular specialists, vascular specialists like yourself or myself. Yeah. What kind of monitoring and safety do we need to, if we're prescribing these medications? 
that's that's a great question. So for uh, HDL2 inhibitor, which I didn't kind of uh, go over too much, is side effects in terms of you know increased urinary tract infection, fungal you know urinary tract and you know um, uh, genital fungal infections. Those are increased uh, with HDL2 inhibitor versus uh, versus placebo. Um, and then so, you know, we usually kind of uh, teach the patients, you know, for hygiene, urinary hygiene, tell them that there will be an increased risk of urinary tract infection or genital mycotic infection. So, um, and so you have to tell them to report any of these uh, side effects, but they will still have increased urination the first couple of weeks because of the mechanism of action. Uh, for GLP-1 receptor agonist, the main kind of uh, side effects is nausea. Uh, because of uh, the, it actually slows, these drugs slow the gastric amputating, so that leads to nausea and vomiting the first couple of weeks. So you go slow in the drug and the doses and go up slowly, slowly. And so you explain that to the patient. You don't want them to get surprised with this nausea, which is part of the deal, right? This is how they kind of lose weight in terms of slowing the gastric amputating. So, and then in terms of A1C and glucose, um, you know, um, Monitoring, if the patient does not have history of diabetes, there is no monitoring that you really have to worry about an A1C uh, risk reduction. Um, so, SGL2 inhibitors, they have, uh, some of them, they have risk of uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. The risk is pretty slim, but it's there, so you really have to uh, discuss that with the patient. Uh, kidney function, the first couple of weeks when you start SGL2 inhibitor, you see increased um, uh, creatinine and reduced EGFR in the first couple of weeks. And actually, that uh, catches up later on, and it actually stabilizes. And on the long run, you actually reduce risk of, of uh, chronic kidney disease in the long run. So creatinine, I would uh, look into this A1C if you have patients with diabetes. But if you don't have patients with uh, diabetes, I wouldn't even uh, worry about checking glucose in these patients, uh, especially with GLP-1 receptor agonists. Um, so, um, you know, so these are the kind of the main things, you know, especially when you track infection, mycotic genital infections. Yeah, Troy. Do you have any recommendations for perioperative modification of these medications? Uh, great question. So uh, with HGL2 inhibitors, uh, some uh, of the recommendations is to hold for 48 hours, uh, two to three days prior to because of the uh, you know, because of the diuretic and kind of properties of these uh, of these drugs. Um, and so a couple of days prior to a procedure and resume uh, next day or the day after based on the outcome of the procedure because of the kidney function as well. So based on the kidney function. Good question. Ooh, too much data, huh? <laughs>